Good afternoon, and thanks, everybody, for coming after lunch. Um, I noticed the weather was good outside, so I'm always glad when people uh, come in. Uh, my name is Louise Fox. I'm a professor in the Masters of Development Practice program here at uh, UC. My primary focus is uh, developing countries, emerging markets. I came here um, this year after um, a long time uh, at the World Bank, where I worked on policy and uh, uh, investment lending as well. Um, so, um, I have a more of an emerging markets focus. The panel is uh, primarily uh, focused on um, U.S. issues, but I think we can have a bit of a discussion about the applications for emerging markets um, as well. When I first started working on poverty and employment and income inequality, uh, when I was in grad school and just after when I went to the World Bank, poverty was fundamentally rural. Today, the majority of the world's poor in developing countries live in urban areas. And um, the population, urbanization, the urban population is growing rapidly. This is a, um, an excellent opportunity for economic growth, diversification, development, and raising living standards in low income and emerging markets if the cities are managed properly. And managing that growth uh, is already a challenge, but with climate change, it's even more of a challenge. And so our panel today is going to talk about how uh, um, cities are managing um, this issue in the, in the U.S. Our first panelist is Laura Tam. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Laura Tam. I am the Sustainable Development Policy Director at SPUR, which is a San Francisco, San Jose, and soon to be Oakland based member supported nonprofit public policy think tank. And we work on issues of resilience and sustainable planning and good government uh, for more than 100 years. And they did ask us to give a TED style talk today, which I associate with special effects. So I would just like to orient you to my talk with uh, calling up the memory, for perhaps for some of you, of the special effect that we hope will not happen, that happened, in fact, 25 years ago today uh, with the Loma Prieta earthquake. And so hopefully we won't have something like that um, happen during this talk or anytime soon, although there is definitely a chance of a, a, a large chance of a seven point something magnitude earthquake on especially the, um, the Hayward Fault, which runs right through this campus uh, in the next 30 or 50 years. I see people looking at the ceiling. Let's, <laughs> let's move on and talk a little bit ah. about, <laughs> um, from moving to the, from the challenge of earthquake resilience, which is something we've done a lot of work on in the Bay Area over the last 25 years, to talking about a new form of resilience that we need to build, and that is to climate change and its impacts. Um, of course, these are some of the driving questions that affect our work at SPUR. How do we react to and respond to the changes that are going to inevitably come that are the result of climate change? Because although this conference and much of our work, too, is focused on trying to stop fossil fuel emissions and run away climate change, which is an urgent enterprise, something we really have to control within the next 15 to 20 years, if we have any hope of limiting Green, uh, global warming to that two degrees C guardrail that is, it's been described as um, of runaway uh, that represents a safe limit, upper limit of climate change. Some climate change is going to be unstoppable and we have to adapt even if we're able to park all our cars and turn all our, make all of our energy come from renewable sources in the next 50 to 100 years. We're still going to have to live with temperature rise, with sea level rise, with changes to our rainfall regime and droughts uh, for hundreds of years. And as we move um, as cities are on the front lines of some of these uh, impacts, we are starting to turn in the Bay Area towards not just the enterprise of mitigation of climate change, but of adaptation. We did a report in 2011 that looked at an assessment, did provide an assessment of impacts that the Bay Area might face going forward and provided some strategies for local government in terms of transportation, energy, water, ecosystems, public health, and sea level rise. And I just want to focus on kind of two of those things so that we can hear from everybody today and then get to a robust discussion. Sea level rise is a force the Bay Area has to reckon with. Um, it's something that uh, the, uh, we have dealt with over the last 100 years or more just due to baseline um, 
global change that has been happening for 10,000 years, that last century of sea level rise is shown in purple here. And this is, uh, this is where we're expecting to go. The National Research Council predicts that we will have uh, six inches of sea level rise by 2030, 12 inches by 2050, and 36 inches by 2100. And that's just the midpoint of the potential range. So we have a lot of uncertainty to plan for, but we do know of the trajectory. And what this means is that today's flood is tomorrow's high tide, and there are many, many places, communities, jobs, homes that are potentially subject to inundation in the Bay Area by 2100. We're working in a couple of places in San Francisco and around the Bay Area to provide a resilient framework for adaptation. And I just want to talk to you about two places very briefly and then turn to our freshwater problems, which come along with our saltwater problems here. This is Ocean Beach in San Francisco in the 1990s. That's Ocean Beach in 2010. And that's Ocean Beach in 2012. We've suffered a lot of erosion on the west side of San Francisco and indeed along the entire Pacific coastline. And our challenge there is to figure out what we can do that is not supposed to be sideways. We worked with a bunch of different uh, federal, state, and local agencies to understand the fact that there's a lot of overlapping jurisdictions in this one narrow place that is subject to global change. And we tried to figure out and work with everyone as well as engage the public on what strategies we could adopt to provide a sustainable way forward for an area that is a beloved recreation area, a, a, an important locus for a lot of our city's key water and wastewater infrastructure, as well as sensitive and endangered species habitat. So a couple of um, ideas that, have, that are going to move forward include protecting some of our water pipes with a different way of armoring the shoreline that's both and at once armoring the shoreline and providing a retreat strategy. Um, we are focusing on uh, rebuilding dunescapes in certain areas, and finally relocating and redesigning some of the roads and the road access to the area in order to provide a better recreational experience, as well as to give a little bit more room for the shoreline to move over time. We're also working on the eastern side of San Francisco. This is Mission Creek near Mission Bay and near AT&T Park where a really awesome baseball game was played last night. We um, are working with a bunch of different city departments, a state agency, and the Dutch government to look at what can be done to protect this most low-lying area of the city from future sea level rise because a high tide and a flood at the end of the century look something like that. Uh, just to orient you briefly, this is the south side of San Francisco. This is where that baseball game took place. Um, this is 3rd Street and 4th Street and Mission Bay here. So this is a flood tide. This is not what everyday sea level rise looks like in 2100, but it is something that we might expect to see once a year or, well, not once a year. There's a 1% chance of this type of flood happening in any one year. Um, and there is, uh, it's something that we have very little flood protection in place to protect, to prevent uh, today. So while this is the end of the century and while this is an extreme event, it is a different kind of extreme event than we've ever planned for and indeed that we've built the Bay Area for to be ready in the future. So we're thinking about what we can do to prevent against that. So, uh, as I said, besides our saltwater problems, our cities face freshwater problems. We're having one of them right now, one of the most severe droughts to impact California in perhaps a thousand years. We turned to the question in a report a couple of years ago about water supply and sustainable infrastructure and said, the Bay Area is going to grow. How much water are we going to need in the future, and how should we supply that water in the future? We have seven million people in the Bay Area right now. By 2035, we'll expect to have another two million. As Louise uh, pointed out, we are not just experiencing urban growth in, the developing, in developing countries, but indeed here in developed countries. Um, more people live in cities now than ever before, and, and um, that, that impact is not, uh, it, it's happening right here in California. Over two thirds of the Bay Area's water supply comes from outside of the region today, and those supplies are regularly threatened by drought, by regulation, by um, water quality impairments, by groundwater overdrafting, and other things. Um, and as well, the Bay Area's growth is just a fraction of the growth that's coming to the entire state of California by the middle of the century. The two million people that are coming here are only a quarter of the eight million people who are moving to California by mid-century all of whom will require a safe and reliable supply of water. 
We used a model developed by the Pacific Institute to look at our future water demand in the Bay Area. And just to summarize it briefly for you, we looked at a variety of variables of how much water we may demand in the future, noting that if climate change um, proceeds apace, we will have a much greater demand of water supply than we do under a baseline scenario. If we're able to grow in a more compact, efficient, and urban way, we may be able to reduce our water from a baseline scenario, water use from a baseline scenario. And if, we're, if we succeed in sustaining conservation savings, as we are doing right now through the middle of the century, we may, have, we may demand as little as 4% more water by the end of the century than we do today, which is amazing. But if not, we may demand as much as 50% more. So the delta between this line and this line is the range of uncertainty and the range of opportunity that we have to supply our water in a more efficient, sustainable approach. Thank so, you, Laura. Oh, okay, sorry. sorry. Um, we could possibly save the rest for the question time? Sure. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, just to briefly close, new de we should save water as much as we can, make new development as water efficient as we can, Oh, and that was all I had to say. So perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. You'll see I'm going to be interrupting them a bit so we get to everybody. Um, Laura, I apologize I didn't inter introduce you properly because I was having trouble getting you on my screen. But uh, as uh, uh, Laura didn't tell you that before her um, working with her current um, company, she was at the EPA. Um, now we have, next we have a, a fellow professor of mine here at uh, UC Berkeley, um, Christina Hill. And uh, you are in the School of Urban? The uh, College of Environmental the Design. College of Environmental Design, which I used to think of when I went here 30 years ago as the School of Urban, yes. The College of Environmental uh, Design. And so she's gonna talk about adapting uh, systems to the new, ch urban systems to the new challenges of climate change. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm gonna focus um, pretty much entirely on the shore zone. So the main reason yeah, this are. is important is because uh, the problem for cities with sea level rise is that the rate of sea level rise we're going to experience over the next 100 to 200 years is novel. Novel in the history of cities. Cities have only existed for five to 7,000 years, and most of the original ones were built in delta areas. So we're going to have to learn to operate cities with a very new condition. What's interesting about the projections, um, and uh, Laura just showed some, this is a recent res uh, product that came out of uh, the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen, trying to summarize expert opinion about where the upper boundary of the sea level rise prediction might be by 2100. And this is most of the debate. Where's it gonna be by 2100? Is it gonna be one meter? Is it gonna be 1.8 meters? Is it gonna be two point something meters? Um, and while this is very, very important to understand what the future may be, the science makes these graphs out of date very quickly. So everything we've learned about ice sheet melting and so on has already put this research out of date uh, within the last two years. It's based on expert opinion from 2012. Here's the piece I think most people are not noticing in these graphs. I just put on um, an increment of 0.2 meters onto the curve and wanted to point out that in the early stages of this, we're talking about eight inches in 25 years. Some people are freaked out by that. Some people say, oh, that's totally doable, depending on where you live and how much infrastructure funding you have. But what we're talking about in the future by 2080 is eight inches in six years. So we have a very challenging problem of how to keep our infrastructure investment cycles and our planning process up to date with the rate of change. It's very human to think, oh, I just put a lot of money into that, I'm okay now. But that's not the way this dynamic is gonna work because it's an exponential rate. So we're gonna have to think about how the lifts work in sequence, how the investments work in sequence and see each one as the basis for the next. In order to keep my talk short, I'm not gonna spend much time on this subject, but this is a chart of wind, um, wind roses around the Bay Area. And what I wanna point out is that there are a lot of engineering firms out there selling adaptation strategies as if there's a one size fits all. And actually context is everything in this context. And the context of wind driven wave energy should be how we look at our adaptation options. These are different, this is a high energy wave regime on the Pacific coast, moderate energy in the San Francisco Bay that's been uh, rip wrapped <laughs> on the edge, 
low energy Sandy Beach at Crown Beach in Alameda, and a very low energy wave regime at Arrowhead Marsh. Um, and we have very different conditions in these places. We may try to alter our wave energy regimes around the bay, but that's the foundation for how we think about what to do at the shore zone. I also want to point out the uh, potential of thinking of our current shoreline, which let's say that this edge of these white shapes is our current shoreline edge. The edge of our current shoreline is in an arbitrary location. It's where development had filled to by 1965, when the McAteer Petrus Act was passed and filling had to stop. It's not optimized. So I think it's reasonable for us, and I can say this because I'm an academic and not in a public agency role, it's reasonable for us to think about how we would do what's being done in the New York City area and consider a new word called shallowing. Not filling, shallowing. And the way we might do shallowing is by adding uh, silt for wetlands, sand for beaches, breakwaters to reduce wave heights, as a way to alter the wave energy regime of the shoreline and make new strategies possible in the shore zone. I'm showing this zone here of uh, wet ponds because we have to manage stormwater from the land and the uh, rise and fall of the amount of water in tributaries coming into the bay as well. And I think these, this complicated pattern here, a new, more complex shore, has to be paid for somehow. The way that that might be paid for is uh, to follow a model that's been used in the Netherlands. This is Rotterdam, where modern, contemporary, beautiful housing has been built in a wet pond. It's been built in a stormwater wet pond because even though these houses are here on piles, not floating, there is three or four feet of headroom of freeboard in that wet pond in which stormwater can be stored, or tidal water in the event of a flood. So we can think about a kind of micro-polder approach in which we actually occupy our adaptive landscape. Occupying the adaptive landscape is a way of paying for the adaptive landscape. If we align the interests of developers and real estate and the increased pressures on housing in the Bay Area with the need to create habitat and protection of people inland, uh, then we have a potential strategy. Let me flip through some proposals that my grad students have done. They're not things on the books, but they're real problems. This is a wastewater treatment plant. Um, and it's down by San Leandro, and uh, it needs to be surrounded by something, in this case, a wedge of wetlands, that could, predict, that could protect it from storm surge and from wave action. And by time, for our centralized sewage treatment system, which is currently very vulnerable, about nine plants around the edge of the bay, to become a decentralized system of packaged plants located on higher ground. But we have to buy time for that. That's going to be a very expensive process. And these wetlands can reduce wave energy and um, storm surge to be able to buy that time. This is another area down in the East Bay near San Leandro. Right now, the bay edge comes uh, right up to these houses and a low seawall. This student proposed a beach for that area because we've learned from the Dutch and the sand engine project north of Rotterdam that we can do this. We can use a beach, dredged sand material, to uh, create protection for that area. And to make it so that people understand what they're getting is an amenity, not just a levee or a flood wall that would block their view. They can know where they live. Uh, another student proposed a system of sand barrier islands along the East Bay. Here's the Berkeley Marina and Pier. Mm -hmm. And allowing wetlands to accrete, maybe speeding up that process, maybe letting it happen as the reduction of wave energy allows it to happen to protect I-80 along with other developments in that area. So we can actively modify the shore zone um, in ways that are important to our ability to live in it. Uh, this is an example of buildings being placed, sorry, these are piles that for some reason are showing gray in this slide, um, buildings being placed in that wet pond of different densities um, to be able to make that financially work. Here's an example of where it's actually been done in Hamburg in Germany. This is the Hafen City District, used to be all warehouses. The bottom slide is going to change if you keep an eye on the water level. That's uh, low tide, high tide, and storm flood. And the key thing there is that the first story of all these buildings is blank and hardened. It's either filled with earth or it's a waterproof parking garage. So this is the first example we've seen in the developed world of a flood intentionally floodable development. And what it allows is for people not to evacuate. This family has stayed in their apartment 
during a major annual flood. And they've stayed there because they can, and so the children are growing up learning that they can be resourceful, not that they have to leave town when the flood comes. That's now being called tiered development, where development is planned in different elevational tiers. And right now in Europe, it includes no habitat, but we could certainly do it in the Bay with a new model that would include created and protected habitat. Thank you. Thank you. Last slide. Excellent. OK, great. Um, Jeff, I believe you are next. Um, while you're setting up, I will just uh, tell everyone that you manage uh, Water Smart Software's go-to market strategy development and marketing campaign activities. And you're going to talk to us about uh, what you've learned about uh, getting people to save water. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone here. Hope you guys are learning uh, a lot this afternoon. I'm going to talk from a slightly different perspective. So I'm uh, an entrepreneur, and we're doing our best to solve some of these problems very practically today uh, that some of the previous panelists have talked about. And some of this may be familiar to you from different industries, uh, but ways that we can use behavioral science and technology and data to change behavior and address some of the resource constraints that we're encountering, particularly related to water. So. Um, there's some challenges we face, right? We want to encourage conservation. We want to encourage water use efficiency in particular. And how do we do that? Uh, people want to do it, maybe, uh, but they're not sure exactly how. How do we encourage them to do such a thing? Well, first of all, you got to get their attention, right? you got to let them know that there's a way to do this and that there's a, an important need. Uh, and historically, when we look at water bills, they come with two pieces of information. One is the volume of water that was consumed in some period, typically in units or in cubic feet, uh, which doesn't mean much to most people. And then there's a number, a dollar value. Uh, and that's it. And it's pretty opaque. Um, and there's a couple reasons why this doesn't work well. One is, is that it doesn't mean much to say four units to most people. And there's a way to calculate the conversion as gallons, but no one does that. And they don't tell you what the conversion is necessarily. And secondly, there's just the dollar value. And when you compare that to something like your phone bill, uh, you'll see that, I think it's hard to see the numbers here, but this is a $31 water bill and a $145 phone bill. So on a relative basis, it's not particularly important to your pocketbook. Uh, so that certainly goes to the point that water is underpriced, but that's for another conversation. Uh, the next is you need to make saving easy. If there's a big hurdle, people aren't going to engage in it. So how do you do that? Uh, people want to conserve, but where do you start? Well, you got to find out where you're using your water. So turns out that about 50% of, of urban use is for irrigation. Many people don't know that. Um, showers are big, as people often consider, but leaks are actually a very large use of water that many people aren't aware they have. Uh, I would encourage you when you leave this uh, session today to ask people how much water they think they use in a given day. And most people will have no idea. They'll say, I, I have 10 gallons? I heard seven the other day. Uh, and, and the average in the United States is around 150 gallons a day. So ask people and see what they say. Maybe a little less in California these days because we've been under some strong encouragement to conserve. But, um, learning where your water goes is the next step. So then you can sort of figure out strategies on how to address uh, your use and, and improve your efficiency. Um, and finally, it's hard to see there. You got to track results and adapt. So this woman is told that if she does full loads of, of laundry, that she'll use less water. And so she starts doing full loads of laundry. And does she use less water? Well, she doesn't know. So there's got to be a way to measure these results so that you can have some reinforcement of the behavior so that you continue to derive those benefits. Um, so again, you got to make it easy. You got to get their attention. You got to make it easy, and you have to track results. So a little about uh, behavioral psychology. Robert Cialdini is a favorite, famous behavioral psychologist. And he did a, uh, a study in the Arizona Petrified Forest and there was a lot of theft of the petrified wood in the forest. And they were concerned about this. It was a natural park. It was under stress. So they put up some signs saying thousands of people visit the forest each year, uh, and many of them steal some wood. Don't be one of them. 
and it turns out that the rates of theft increased. <laughs> And I heard a rumor, this is an anecdote, I can't verify that it's actually true, that uh, some family or couple was visiting the forest and then they heard one of the rangers give, tell, giving this message, like, you know, there's thousands of thefts, don't be one of them. And the family was sitting in the back of the, uh, the presentation, was like, man, we better get ours now before it's all gone. <laughs> so then they changed the message and they went back to the drawing board and they said, wait a second, uh, we're using a descriptive norm, we're telling what people are doing and we're telling them not to do that thing. And they changed the message and they said, millions of people who visit the petrified forest every year make sure there's enough wood available for all of us to enjoy. Mm -hmm. So they changed the message from one of don't do what a few people are doing to here is the injunctive behavior that we want to encourage, which is to leave it for everyone. And the theft rates dramatically dropped. So that was an interesting study. So, Water smart software, we use the same mechanism basically to encourage people to use water. We have an experimental process. We randomly divide households. Uh, we create a model. And we uh, then separate a treatment group from a control group and we send the treatment group home water reports which compares their consumption to their efficient neighbors. And along with that, we give them customized recommendations based on where their water consumption is in their house on ways they can save. And we compare that against the control group, and guess what? It works. So we take meter data from the utilities, we take rebate and incentive data, um, we gather external data from surveys and property assessment records so we can create a model of the size of each home and the number of bedrooms and bathrooms so we can estimate where water in the home is going. And then we deliver these water reports which shows exactly how much is being used in terms of gallons, where the majority is going by use case, and then we create the normative comparison and they get a score and we have custom recommendations on ways they can save. If most of their use is outdoor, we give them irrigation control recommendations. If it's mostly indoor, we say take a shorter shower or install a low flow toilet. And we give them little uh, water droplets, smiley faces if they're doing well against their neighbors and frowny faces if they're not. And it seems kind of corny, but it actually works. Uh, financial incentives don't typically work over time. Uh, and messages around community benefit or environmental benefit don't work over time. But the normative comparison, everyone wants to fit in, and this persistently changes behavior as long as the communications continue. Um, and then the results are, they speak for themselves. So over a few months, people uh, start saving on average about over 5%. And that's a modest amount, but added up, uh, we've helped save over 700 million gallons of water, which is about enough to uh, provide the city of, of San Diego for a year. So these are very practical, low cost, and highly effective uh, strategies for improving efficiency that we can all take advantage of today. Thank you. Great. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Shalini, and uh, like many people on this panel, uh, Shalini has, uh, has decades of experience in green design, engineering, economics, policy, uh, on a range of issues. And uh, also, like several other people on this panel, she had a stint at the EPA. <laughs> so, Melanie, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Shalini Vajala. I'm sorry, and I, no, Shalini. That's, <laughs> I, I turn that's... around to almost anything that starts with a sh. <laughs> <laughs> and I am the founder and CEO of Refocus Partners, which is a small firm that focuses on designing and building resilient infrastructure systems through public-private partnerships. I'm going to start with a story. So the image that you see on the screen here is actually from the city of LA. This was this past July when, and this should be a, a little video. Um, this was this past July when a 90-year-old water main broke in downtown LA and gushed over 10 million gallons of water into UCLA's campus. Um, the damages were extensive. And this is an example of how we know what a sustainable city doesn't look like, but we have very little idea of what one does look like. What you see here are some intrepid students who still managed to make it to class through feet of water. <laughs> um, and there were several parking garages, one that was flooded out many levels from the bottom. And so this example is a good way of pointing out that we are much better 
at seeing the absence of resilience and sustainability than designing for the presence of it. So what I want you to imagine through this talk is think about designing for this. If you wanted to prevent flooding and protect people, could you actually use a parking garage to hold water and do it on purpose? That's the kind of thing that my firm does. So I'm going to speak a little bit about an initiative called reInvest that we kicked off in, in the beginning of 2013 with the generous support of the Rockefeller Foundation. And we took a really unusual approach to brokering public-private partnerships. We assembled SWAT teams of engineers, lawyers, and finance experts on the theory that you had to design new infrastructure systems with the financing in mind to be successful. And so our partners on this initiative were some really strange bedfellows. They included Bechtel Engineering, uh, Aiken Gump, which is a major DC law firm, uh, a group of investment bankers, or as my team likes to call them, reformed investment bankers, uh, who all had no conflicts of interest and were assembled through an organization called Wall Street Without Walls. It's Wall Street's answer to Doctors Without Borders. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and my team, which are a group of renegade policy experts who know how to do the bureaucratic jiu-jitsu to line up cities. What we did is we ran a competition. We did a national competition and asked cities to apply to receive support from the SWAT team. And of course, any competition designers, we spent several weeks panicked that no one would apply, and then we were bludgeoned by applications from across the country. And we selected the eight cities you see here that include San Francisco, but range all the way from Hoboken to Milwaukee to El Paso to Honolulu. These cities all applied because they knew they had a problem, but they didn't necessarily know what the solution was. So, reInvest was designed to help them figure out cross-cutting solutions at a citywide scale and integrate the financing for public-private partnerships. So what's the approach that we took? Well, first of all, we actually said we put the focus squarely on resilience. We didn't want to talk about doing one tiny project in one tiny part of a city. We wanted to be able to look across whole systems for efficiencies and to be able to capture costs and benefits across multiple sectors. What does this mean? It means that when you look at a city, oftentimes the water system is the biggest energy user in a municipal government. So rather than trying to squeeze efficiency out of a marginal investment in the sector where they're squarely its focus, we wanted to be able to reach across sectors. And that's part of the reason our competition was structured, so that we pulled forward leaders who had departments that would play nicely with each other. That was one of our requisites for selecting cities for reinvest. We also focused on reframing success, like the LA water main break, to focus on avoided losses. So we spent a lot of time with our cities asking them where they were losing money today. Don't worry about climate change. We can guarantee you wherever you're losing money today is where you're going to lose more money in future. Let's focus on where your basements are flooded. Let's focus on where your water mains are breaking. And then what we did is we actually looked at ways of integrating project design across sectors. So what could we combine that would be completely outlandish that we could handle, hand to our engineering team and have them tell us whether it would work or not? So could we stick broadband into water pipes to help finance water system upgrades or leak detection? Could we combine parking and stormwater storage? And when you start doing that, all of a sudden, you bring together multiple colors of money to pay for the same project. So what this slide shows you is this is how cities think. On the left, you have a series of dots. I want you to picture these as needs that you might imagine in your own community. Potholes, you know, that tree that's wilting out in the middle of the road. Um, and failing schools, all of it, in the same bucket. Everything you need for a community to work. Cities are organized into these silos. The Department of Transportation, or as EPA is organized, air and water. <laughs> and then investment banks are organized into layers. They think about layered finance so that they're not the only investors. And these things don't actually talk to one another. So what do we do? We basically go from their idea of a dream house, fix the pothole, replace the tree, to developing a blueprint, something you can actually build that's not an abstract idea, to a mortgage document. And I'm going to give you three examples. And I'm also going to redeem the city of LA after tearing them apart on that first slide. <laughs> LA did something really smart. When they were looking at pothole repair, they went and did a survey of car insurance claims to figure out how much it was costing every individual car owner to have bad roads. 
And they figured out that people on average were spending $832 a year in extra, just replacing blown out tires, damages to cars. And if all those same people put $26 a year, they could repair all their streets. That's our approach here. This is a drawing from the city of Hoboken, which had 12 feet of standing water in it after Hurricane Sandy. It's built like a bowl. And the solution we put together was actually combining an underground parking garage with a, a, ch a chamber, an underground bathtub for combined sewer overflows to finance a solution and upgrade a water system subsidized by parking fees from residents in a city that's right next to New York City. This particular solution is one that the city just went forward with a financing application for in the $120 million range to hold 300 parking spaces and 20 million gallons of flood water that would protect 55,000 residents. And ideally, the city hopes to move forward with this project as part of a larger strategy of green infrastructure that includes soccer fields on top of this garage that are built to absorb a million gallons of water just on a regular rainy day and protect all the surrounding homes and basements. Very different, Miami Beach, which is where all the terror articles on climate change come out in places like Rolling Stone. <laughs> Miami Beach, um, I didn't know this until I went down there, has 68, uh, 63 miles of seawall. So this is a tiny island. How does it have that much seawall? Actually, it has a huge number of channels and teeny islands. And the seawalls are holding up the island. So they're not something abstract out into the sea to reduce wave strength. They're actually retaining walls. We realized in Miami Beach, to replace this wall, there's no structural solution where you take down the existing wall. You have to build a wall on the outside of the existing wall to hold everything up and raise the height. Well, when you do that, you're actually adding real estate to the most expensive real estate on the eastern seaboard. And you can use tax increment finance to finance seawall construction and protect not only Miami Beach, but also Miami. The last example I'll give you is from the city of Milwaukee, which is now one of my favorite cities in the US after not having even been on my radar screen. Thank you. And, uh, we're designing the equivalent of an IKEA showroom for showcasing resilient technologies in Milwaukee and doing demonstration on unused real estate. So I'm gonna stop with this one. What does a, sustainability, a sustainable city look like? Well, it looks like something we all recognize and carry around in our pockets. It looks like an integrated city. Thank you. Okay, now after Shalini, we have Melanie Nutter. And um, Melanie is the principal of her own consulting firm, not your consulting. Um, and she also has decades of experience in policy, design, economics, planning, development, working with cities and foundations. Uh, Melanie worked with Mayor Gavin Newsom when he was a mayor before he became lieutenant governor. Um, and. Um, uh, she's uh, also worked with um, with other cities. So thank you very much, Melanie. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Enjoying the conference so far? Excellent. Um, well, I just want to, first of all, thank you for the invitation to be on this esteemed panel. Um, I learned so much in the past 40 minutes. Thank you all for those great presentations. Um, what I wanted to do is just give you a little bit of a snapshot of what we've been doing in San Francisco, um, not only on adaptation, but also on mitigation. Um, thinking about reducing our uh, carbon emissions worldwide, we do have to think of a two-pronged strategy, which includes mitigation and adaptation strategies. Um, and just to, we'll, we'll get going here. So to take us back out to the very macro level, um, one thing that we've touched a little bit on but wanted to just put a finer point on it is that cities around the globe are currently responsible for 75% of the carbon emissions. So we know that cities are both a part of the problem but have to be part of the solution. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because you already heard from Laura and others about what some of the threats are when you bring it back down to the Bay Area. Um, this is of course the worst case scenario of looking at a one meter sea level rise in 2100. And we do like to show these alarming pictures just to give people a visualization of what we'd be looking at. Not only would our beloved ballpark and our giants be underwater, um, but 96 miles of roadway, our airport, um, and a lot of very critical infrastructure. And in fact, from the Spur report um, that Laura's organization did, and I think Laura put together, um, we're also looking at billions of dollars of infrastructure damage. So it's not only an environmental impact, but um, an economic impact as well, looking at this type of sea level rise. 
Um, other impacts, of course, you've heard quite a bit about flooding, but another thing we haven't touched too much on is high heat. So there are projections right now that high heat days in San Francisco um, would increase fourfold. And so again, not only looking at the environmental impacts, the economic impacts, but the health impacts of what this type of uh, climate change could do to the Bay Area. And so what a lot of cities do is start first with an inventory. We want to understand where do the carbon emissions come from so we can start our mitigation strategies. And in San Francisco, which is similar to many cities in the US, um, a majority come, 52% come from building energy, 43% um, from transportation, and a small portion from waste. So we know that if we want to have successful mitigation programs, they need to be focused in these sectors. So the, the good news in San Francisco is that we have reduced carbon emissions by 14.5 percent below 1990 levels. That's actually double the Kyoto Protocol target, so um, we're definitely making progress. But to give you some sense of how much more work we do need to do, San Francisco has adopted a goal, again like many cities in the U.S. and around the world, to reduce carbon by 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2050. So as you can see, there's still a long way to go to try to reduce uh, carbon. But the good news is, as I mentioned, we're at 14.5% below. And this is just a snapshot of some of the successful mitigation programs that we've had in San Francisco. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but just to point out energy efficiency as a key component, often the most lowest hanging fruit to reduce our energy use and our carbon. Um, we've had a great partnership for about seven years with um, Pacific Gas and Electric, running their Energy Watch program and helping small businesses retrofit their, their businesses. Um, and then, of course, uh, greening our energy supply. So San Francisco has been committed to solar energy, running the Go Solar program, which is a local rebate. And what that's resulted in is over 4,000 solar installations on home and homes and businesses in San Francisco. And just to give a shout out to our current board president, David Chu, um, yesterday he just set a new goal for the city, which is to have 50 megawatts of in-city solar um, by 2020. So a great target that helped to uh, will help to spur the market. And of course, outreach and education and financing mechanisms as well. So where we're going from here on the mitigation strategy, one of the things that I did at the department before I left was worked on our climate action strategy. And it really can be summed up in these points, 0, 50, and 100. Working to achieve our zero waste goal, right now the city is at 80% diversion, but reducing our waste to zero by 2020. Um, the second strategy is a 50% mode shift. So trying to get 50% of people in San Francisco out of their cars um, a majority of the time, which helps to reduce carbon emissions from transportation. And then 100% renewable energy, which is an aspirational goal, but one that the city has set. I'll skip that for now. Um, so that's just kind of a quick snapshot on the mitigation strategies locally. Um, most cities now are taking the approach of mitigation first and then, of course, looking to adapt, knowing that most cities, all cities, will not be able to ward off the worst effects of climate change, even under the best case scenario. So um, you've heard a little bit about some of the great adaptation work that's happened in the Bay Area and, and other places. Um, this is just a quick description of what's been happening on the municipal side. So right now, the city is very much in an assessment mode, understanding what are the assets that are owned by the city that will come under threat. So here you've got the Public Utilities Commission looking at our water supply. Um, you've got the port looking at the seawall and what the impacts are. Um, our transportation agency looking at what things like flooding would do to our transportation transportation system, our rail yards, our transit stops. Um, SFO, of course, which is definitely under threat, looking at how to shore up those runways. Um, and then really interesting, the Department of Public Health did get a grant from the CDC to look at localized health impacts in San Francisco, and particularly vulnerable communities. There's a report coming out in about six weeks that's called a climate and health profile um, that will be a lot of great information, actionable data about what are the health impacts, who's affected, and then some uh, strategies for action. Uh, one last thing I'll mention, uh, there was a discussion around financing. So one innovative thing that, this, that San Francisco is doing is integrating adaptation planning into their capital planning process. So there's a 10-year capital planning um, strategy for San Francisco, which is where the money gets raised to invest in infrastructure and local assets. And there is a strategy that's being led by the Public Utilities Commission to be able to prioritize and understand what are the assets that are most at risk and how to adapt, and then how to fund them and putting that into the city system. 
Um, so I guess I'll just wrap up on transitioning to sort of the tech angle. Um, one of the things that I'm working on now is really focused on smart cities and um, trying to find where the opportunities are for technology to enable um, sustainability and adaptation. A lot of cities have launched open data initiatives, which is releasing open data sets um, to the entrepreneurial sector. In San Francisco, there's about 600 data sets that are online. Um, and this really helps to spur new innovations in sustainability. Two interesting examples in San Francisco is um, we're working with a company called City Zenith, where they're taking all of the building data information, energy use, from the commercial sector and putting it into a visualization platform so that property owners as well as others can see what commercial buildings in San Francisco are energy hogs and which ones are doing great sort of on the behavior, the behavior change piece to try to inspire um, more energy efficiency and renewables in buildings. Um, and then one other interesting resource is the sfenergymap.org. Um, it's a place where anyone in San Francisco, whether you're a resident or a business, can go and find out what the solar or wind potential is of your address, um, money that you can save on your energy bill, rebates, local contractors. So it's a great resource for getting uh, renewables up and running. Um, so in the end, this is what we're, many cities are trying to do, is fusing the um, data-driven, low-carbon, but community-focused aspects of serving our citizens well. And San Francisco has made some great progress, but there's still a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm really grateful to all the panelists for uh, keeping to time so that we have a chance for a little bit of uh, discussion among the panel. Uh, I'm an economist by training, and um, I often think of, I, I teach now about the political economy of uh, policy change. So I want to uh, push uh, all of you to discuss a little bit about the political economy of of making cities uh, more resilient. And maybe to think beyond um, what I sometimes think of as this uh, unbelievable bubble of, uh, of the Bay Area in terms of uh, thinking about uh, energy and the environment uh, to the broader um, US. And to talk about how local leaders who want to increase resilience can really bring populations along. When you saw Jennifer uh, Granholm's graph this morning, number one one issue is uh, uh, economy, jobs, and terrorism, and climate change and all of that is, uh, is way at the bottom. And related to that, and an issue that is very much on the table here um, in the Bay Area, is the increasing income inequality. Now, in my world, everyone's talking about how the poorest countries are going to get hurt the most uh, by climate change. But you can make an argument that it, it's also possibly the, some of the poorest people in the U.S. that um, some of, there are some very vulnerable populations in cities, in rural areas, in suburbs, um, who will be not able to cope uh, with some of these um, uh, sea level rises, uh, weather events, etc. And you know, it seems like the politics lends itself toward mitigation not toward preparation. And to the extent that it lends itself toward preparation, you know, it's sort of the rich that take out earthquake insurance, not the poor. So how can these challenges, this challenge uh, of, um, of increasing inequality, of uh, people's uh, focus, current focus being on um, livelihoods, their current livelihood right now, and not so future-oriented. How can that be tackled as cities try to increase uh, resilience? I think what I'll do is I'll go from Melanie uh, this way, since you started. We'll uh, let you come to the end. Great. Um, so I think it's really um, about putting people first and talking about the impacts to communities. Because when you're talking about protecting assets and infrastructures, the engineers get really excited, and sometimes the sometimes the policymakers will sometimes. <laughs> um, but when you bring people into it, ultimately cities are set up to serve their communities and their constituents. And so when you can directly connect it back to how it will impact people, um, that's often s sometimes what needs to happen to um, to get the proper political support. And just to expand on the Department of Public Health project, um, it's a really fascinating 
fascinating report where it's looking at things like cooling centers, which we don't necessarily have in San Francisco. We don't have air conditioning right. infrastructure because we have such a mild climate. So when you're looking at increases in high heat days, it's the vulnerable that are really going to be impacted by that, not being able to get to um, a cooling center or figuring out where there is one if the city has set it up. Um, so I think there's also uh, connections to asthma. There's also connections to um, waterborne diseases. There's some really impactful things that are going to be in part of this climate and health report that I think will help to spur some of that policy for planning and, and resilience. Um, that was a great answer, and I'm so glad Melanie started on health care because I think we tend to think of climate change as unique. Is that, can you guys hear me? Oh, okay. We tend to think of climate change as somewhat unique, but we've really been dealing with this problem in healthcare much longer, which is we really don't know how to fund prevention. And that's what we're talking about with adaptation. So it's much easier to treat a disease than it is to treat health. And we don't know what health looks like. We know what sickness looks like. So it's the same problem. So three things that we've been doing that tackle the in income inequality and the political economy pieces of this. The first is by focusing on where you can save cities money, you get away from talking about climate change and the political third rail altogether. Are your basements flooding? Great. We don't care why. <laughs> Let's talk about how you <laughs> save <problem>. that money. <laughs> and it's a completely different conversation. The second thing is that all of a sudden when you focus on where cities are losing money, most of that money is being lost in the most vulnerable communities. So all of a sudden you shift the conversation from trying to protect the high rises, which are already fairly well built, to really trying to save that community out on the outer edge of New Jersey or New York that's right in the path of the storm. And then the third piece is something that, from my own experience at EPA, I, I find these issues that are the most important also to be the hardest to defend politically. So success is something that doesn't happen. All right, I'm going to say that again. Success is something that doesn't happen. So that means in the first year, you're applauded and you give a speech. In the second year, your funding's cut off. In the third year, you lose your job. <laughs> because nothing happened, <laughs> even though that was success. And so we have to be able to reframe this. And that's part of the reason for coming back around and saying, what are we saving today? And that's why I like Jeff's tool, too. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to speak to the in income inequality issue. That gets a little more complicated now in my uh, sphere right now. But um, uh, we saw pictures of Los Angeles being flooded uh, with water. Uh, there was an estimate I saw the other day that the American Society of Engineers is guessing that there's about 240,000 water main breaks each year in the United States. Yeah. We've seen estimates as high as nearly $5 trillion of needed infrastructure investment over the next 20 years. And I guarantee that number is going to go up because um, many municipalities don't even know where their uh, assets are. Um, so we need more, in, we need investment in infrastructure because the long-term benefits from a f purely financial perspective are great. Uh, we have an issue with water right now where we're being encouraged to conserve. And what happens is, is that the uh, utilities then lose revenue and they can't cover their operating costs. So then they raise rates on us after we do a good job of improving our efficiency. But they're taking a very short-sighted view. And the rates need to cover not only the fixed assets and the operating expenses, but the long-term capital investments. Because over time, operating costs come down and also then we're not uh, addressing, we're, we're building for resiliency and lowering our long-term expenses and rates will, let, will rise much slower. So I think that engaging individuals in the community in the long-term benefits of investment now will both pave the way politically to make some difficult choices but will also um, bring prices down over time, make our systems and our cities more resilient, and, and benefit everyone long term. I think that uh, if you look objectively at what's happening around the United States, a lot of waterfront areas are already being redeveloped for wealthier residents. And that's partly a result of deindustrialization in the United States, factories closing, uh, industrial waterfronts switching to recreational waterfronts and uh, the success of environmental laws that have made that water cleaner. So ironically, as a result of those things, developers now see waterfront sites as prime real estate. Around the Bay, around Baltimore, around New York, most of that waterfront used to be industrial and polluted, and so it was a refuge for lower income homeowners um, to own property on Staten Island, places like that. So um, as we make this big economic transition of our waterfront being very differently valued, we have an opportunity to pick up some money off of that to protect people and create affordable housing as part of that transition. If we don't take advantage of that transition over the next 20 years, 15 years, we're going to miss a huge opportunity. 
And instead, what I hear being proposed is things like uh, increases in property taxes, which in spite of Prop 13 is still a pretty regressive strategy uh, that burdens people who are already close to their, their limit in paying property taxes around the Bay Area. So I, I think we have to look at a strategy that's going to be uh, an investment in infrastructure that actually benefits people of lower income. And that's not how we've thought about infrastructure investments in the last 50, mm -hmm. 40 years. We've thought about it as something you do to encourage development that supports investment in urban areas. The investment in urban areas is happening. We don't have to support that. We don't have to encourage it. It's already happening. And we have to figure out instead how to keep the poor from being shunted out to the suburbs and finding themselves without transit um, with more heat problems in the Bay Area anyway. So we have to look at the larger picture and see what the trend is, which is to redevelop all these shoreline zones for wealthier people. Great. What a great set of answers. I hate to go last, but um, <laughs> I guess I would just say, just to add to all that, and especially to Christine's point, which I wanted to also say that with all the energy around redevelopment and focusing on the shorelines, we have the opportunity to protect not only the new waterfronts and seawalls and new development that is happening close to the water by interest that protects a whole bunch of land behind it and a whole bunch of infrastructure that serves everyone. So besides, but, but what I really wanted to say was that the conversation around this topic of adapting to climate change, in my experience, having worked on this issue for a number of years, has changed a lot in the last 18 months, I would say, mm -hmm. and a lot of it stems from the impacts of Hurricane Sandy. And the conversation has moved from one of adaptation, and although that's a part of it, to talking about resilience. And resilience reframes that idea of, of climate change to think about its impacts on people. And that is bringing the equity issue into the conversation. So I think that we're going to start moving forward. The conversation ab about resilience will naturally bring up um, and it's our job as policy makers and developers and planners to keep that at the table, but I think it's changing in a way that is beneficial to people who would otherwise be left out of the conversation, not have the resources to pay for um, necessary infrastructure improvements or to even improve uh, mobility and, and preparedness in their own lives. So there are also a number of things that we have to do at the municipal level to make changes. Uh, we recently passed an ordinance in San Francisco that requires all soft story buildings, which are the kind of buildings that are most likely to fall down in an earthquake, many of which are tenant occupied um, or low income households to the, the, the property owners have to retrofit. There's a mandatory retrofit requirement now for those types of buildings in San Francisco by a certain time frame. I forget what it is. But that's the kind of thing we have to do to prepare our built environment to protect those who are most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And finally, just on the political economy question, we are fortunate in the Bay Area, in, a, in our bubble here, not to be having the debate about whether or not climate change exists. <laughs> and I think we need to take advantage of that to move forward and figure out how we build resilience to develop a model for the rest of the country. Okay, those are great answers. We've uh, reached uh, the end of our appointed time, and we do now have a short break. I think what I'd like to do is, um, is to encourage you all during the break to bring your follow-up questions to the panel, um, because I know they're going to be staying around, and they'll be happy to answer um, as many of your questions during the break as they can. So at this point, can we just give them a big round of applause?